Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the book of Philippians. I say book, it's a letter really. And it was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to build up and encourage a church that was in Philippi. And I'll be reading from Philippians chapter 3 verses 4 through 14. And this is what it says. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already obtained this or have already reached that goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Pray with me. Jesus, Paul, building up the church a long time ago, said, press on, press on, press on. Jesus, speak to us as we open Scripture, that our hearts might be open to your voice, our ears might be attentive to your voice. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Charles Allen, in one of his books, tells a story about two fellas that bumped into each other on a busy city sidewalk. They hadn't seen each other in many years, and they began catching up, and the conversation quickly moved from the sidewalk to a coffee shop. And as they caught up with each other, one of the fellas looked down at his watch and realized he had missed his train. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to go. I've, I'm already late getting home, and, and I, I've missed my train. He said, I didn't know you worked close by, but tomorrow I work close by, and why don't we meet for lunch? So that's what they decided to do. The next day when they got together for lunch, one of the fellows said, well, what did your wife say about being late coming home from work yesterday? He said, well, all I could do was apologize and say I'm sorry. I told her that we had bumped into each other and that I th th let time get away and I missed my train and I was late coming home and I just said I'm sorry. How about your wife? What did she say? The other fellow said, well, my wife got historical. He said, you mean hysterical? 
He said, no, historical. She brought up things I did 20 years ago. <laughs> well, we all have a tendency to get historical. We all have a tendency to bring up things that happened in the past and bring them up and, and into the future. We all have a tendency to get historical. And that's what the Apostle Paul is dealing with right here in Philippians. Some folks are getting historical. They're talking about their, their past trophy. They're talking about their past resume. They're talking about their past accomplishments and how they should lead everyone since Paul isn't there to lead. So Paul writes them a letter. He says, if anybody has a, 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 a chance to point to their trophy case, I have more opportunity than anybody else. If anybody else wants to point to the resume, my resume is better than anybody else. If anybody wants to point to their past accomplishments, if anybody wants to get historical... Paul says, I have more reason than anyone else. And he, he goes to begin to lift, list off those, those things that are in his trophy case, those past accomplishments. That he can trace his family back before Moses. That his tribe was the tribe of Benjamin, only one of two tribes to support King David when all the other ten turned away. And the sect in that tribe, he is a Pharisee. That they didn't just obey the Ten Commandments, they obeyed all 613 commandments that were based on those Ten Commandments. And as far as following those, he says, blameless. That means he didn't just score a 90 or do pretty well, 100 every time. And he says, if anybody wants to point to the trophy case, the resume, the accomplishments, I fair more. But then he goes on to say, he goes on to say, compared to the, to knowing Christ, that's rubbish. If you were following along in your Bibles, some of your Bibles might not have used the word rubbish. They might have used the, the word refuse or garbage. And the reason why the Bible translators use a different word is because Paul uses a very harsh word here to talk about this rubbish. It's the word for sewage. It's not something you just throw away. It's something you want to run from like your hair's on fire. He's, you know, compared to knowing Christ, that past, that I want to separate myself as far from it as possible. It's not just a little bit offensive. I want to run from it. I want to separate myself compared to knowing Christ. And he says that he presses on. And that's the chorus that goes through these verses. To press on. To press on. To press on. To look forward. To go forward. Not get historical, look into the past, but to look forward. I think that's a good word for us today to press on, to look forward, to press forward, to go forward. And the first thing that I want to talk about this morning is Paul says he, he presses forward in personal faith. Verse 10a, this is what Paul says. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. He doesn't say, I want to know about the example that Christ gave for us. He says, I want to know Christ. He doesn't say, you know, I want to know about some of the, the ethic that Jesus laid down. No, he says, I want to know Christ. He's speaking in the present tense. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That it's not just knowing about Jesus. He says, I want to know Christ in the here and the now and the power that Jesus has. James Moore tells a story about a time he was invited to give the invocation at a rodeo. He said he was backstage waiting to be called on to give the prayer before the rodeo began that day. And he said there were a couple of cowboys. Both of them were bull riders. They were swapping stories with each other about all the times they'd either been stepped on by a bull or had a bull break their ribs or uh, a, a bull sprain their back or uh, their ankle or whatever. And he said about that time, a, a fella that was 
dressed up in brand new cowboy boots, fresh pressed Levi's, cowboy shirt, and brand new cowboy hat walked by. Both cowboys stopped their, their conversation and, and said hello to the fella who obviously had never been close to a horse. And he walked past and then one of the cowboys said, yeah, all hat and no cattle. <laughs> maybe you've heard that expression before, all hat and no cattle. Or maybe you heard it as all icing and no cake or all sizzle and no steak. The saying means the same, that it's all fluff and no substance. Paul's talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that has power, that has substance. And that power is the power of peace. That power is the power of joy. That power is a power that's stronger than the circumstances. And Paul's circumstances right now is that he's in jail. He's not sitting in a field of clover just writing out nice theology. That Paul is talking about the power of knowing Jesus Christ is power enough to encourage a church that is free. He's sitting in jail encouraging those who are free because he knows the risen Christ. That Jesus died on the cross to take all those things that would destroy us. Life is hard. And you don't have to live much of life to know that life is hard. That life is includes suffering. And Jesus knew suffering. And it's in that suffering on the cross, He took all those things that would destroy us. He took suffering itself. He took death itself, and He nailed it to the cross. And he, he, when He rose from the grave, He rose not just to give us a good example are some words that we might follow, that we follow Him, that the power of the resurrection is the resurrected Christ in the here and the now, that no matter the circumstances, that we can trust Him. We can lean on Him. He's been where we're going. So we don't look to the past. We don't look to the suffering. We don't look to the pain. We don't look. We look to Christ and we press on in a personal faith, in a personal relationship that conquered all those things that would defeat us. And in the power of the risen Christ, we might know joy. We not, might know peace. We might know a power that's stronger than our circumstances. And, and we trust Him. Not a, an example of Jesus, but we trust Him in the here and the now. Press on. Press on in a personal faith, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But Paul doesn't stop there. He presses on and he invites us to remember who you are. Verse 12b, this is what Paul says. He says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. That Christ, that we're his own. That that's our identity in Christ. We belong to him. We are his own. We are his own possession is what the Bible says again and again and again. That's our identity. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. The connection is there that we belong to him. There's no such thing as a, as, as a, as a branch without a vine. That we are his own. We belong to him. That it's, that it's his power that lives in and through us. We are his own. Years ago, <laughs> it was the middle of the night. And I got a phone call. Well, out of a dead sleep, the person on the other end of the, the line, they identified themselves as my credit card company. And they, they didn't ask me to, for me to give a lot of confirming detail. They're the ones that provided the detail that only my credit card company would know. Not only my name, but my credit card number. And then they asked me this question. They said, are you in Bulgaria at a women's lingerie shop making a large purchase? 
<laughs> I said, no, I'm in Georgia asleep. At least I was. And they said, okay, we won't accept the charges. Someone had tried to compromise my identity. And I didn't go to sleep well after that. If somebody's going to compromise your identity, the least they could do is, you know, you'll maybe make a house payment or something. But that's not what they were wanting to do. They weren't wanting to compromise my identity for better. They were wanting to compromise my identity for worse. And we live in a world that's all about identity. Compromising our identity. And most often, most often the compromise isn't between good and bad. The compromise that this world is trying to compromise our identity with is between good and and God, being something less than being his own. Being something less than being his very own possession. To compromise our identity. Pastor Don Tuttle tells a story about a play he read. The main character in the play is a fellow named Sam. Sam bumps into Jesus on the sidewalk in this play. And, and Jesus asks him, are you willing to take up my cross and follow me? Sam says, yes. Well, Jesus gives him a cross, but it's not a cross that he can put in his pocket or put on a chain and keep it beneath his shirt. It's full-size cross. And so everywhere that Sam goes, the, the cross is getting in the way. Sam goes to work, and after a little while, the boss says, yeah, this cross, it's getting in your way. It used to be that you would be willing to compromise the truth with customers in order to benefit the business. And this cross is getting in your way. In the next scene, Sam has a, a date with his girlfriend. His girlfriend says the cross is getting in the way because it used to be that he was like everybody else. And now why does he have to be so different? Can't he just be like everybody else? And the cross gets in the way. In the next scene, Sam is with his friends. And he enjoyed his friends. He loved his friends. But the cross got in the way. Because it used to be that his friends enjoyed criticizing other people. They enjoyed belittling other people behind their backs. But now the cross was getting in the way. Most often, our identity is compromised, not in a choice between good and, and bad. Most often, this world tries to compromise our identity between good and, and God, being God's own. Between being his own possession and, and identifying ourselves as, as something that's not God. Now, it may be good, but it's not God. The way C.S. Lewis put it, it, says, he said, every human love has a tendency to claim for itself divine authority. Every human love. Well, Paul's talking about personal faith here. It's not a faith that's just love, love, love. That, that, that's a human love that has a tendency to claim for itself divine authority. And, and C.S. Lewis goes on to say, you know, World War II, the case could be easily made that it was a, about a love of country. That Germany was called to love of the motherland. There's nothing wrong with love of country. But when it supersedes, when it becomes our, our primary identity, rather than love of Christ. Our identity is compromised. Love of country is a good thing. It's a very good thing. And our identity most often is, is compromised not by a difference between good and bad. It's compromised by the difference between good and God and love for God. Well, he doesn't just stop there. C.S. Lewis goes on to, to talk about that love of children, that a mother's love a father's love, it's a good thing, but it has a tendency to claim for itself divine authority. And how many times have, have you heard parents say that I love my children so much that I spoil them? Well, it's not a love that, that makes greater and better and closer to Christ. It's a love that, 
breaks down. And that even a primary identity as a, as a parent rather than God's own is a compromise of our true identity as God's own. You've heard love is love. Well, that's exactly what C.S. Lewis was talking about. Love is not love. Every human love has a tendency to claim for itself divine authority. And it's easy to imagine the romantic relationship that soon becomes bad for us. That it claims for itself, but I love him, but I love her. Even if it destroys all the relationships around us, even if it compromises who Jesus Christ made us to be in him. God's own, God's own possession. That the compromise isn't between good and bad, it's between good and God. That the real demons in our lives, the real demons in our lives aren't, don't come from fallen rats or, or fleas or, or bad things. The real demons in our lives, well, demons come from fallen angels. It's whatever's highest, it's whatever's best, it's whatever is good that we make into God. That Paul is calling us to press on, not toward good, but to our identity as God's own possession, God's own people. Remember who you are, that you are, you are his own his very own possession. And press on and remember who you are. But that's not where Paul stops. The third thing that I want, the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is verse 13b. This is at the very end of when Paul's talking and this is what he says. He says, this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. That it's not only remembering who we are, it's forgetting who we're not. That we press on to forget, to forget who we're not. That Paul, when he, he talks about his trophy case, for the most part, he, he talks about those things that shine, those things that glitter, those things that are in, on his resume, those things that are the best. But there's one thing listed in that list of things. He says that he's a, a born a, 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 of the tribe of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee. He talks about blamelessness. All those shine and glitter just fine. But then there's this one thing, a persecutor of the church. Paul didn't just persecute the church with harsh language. No, he persecuted the church with imprisonment. He persecuted the church with beatings. He persecuted the church with murder. Paul was an accessory to murder and the stoning of Stephen. These aren't all just the best things that Paul's ever done. As a matter of fact, there's one on that list that I imagine every Christian had in the back of his mind that he had been a part of imprisoning their friends. He had been a part of imprisoning people they knew. He had been a part of making sure they were, were beaten. And Paul says, forget about it. Press on, forget about it. There's a story that comes from the, after the end of the Civil War says that Robert E. Lee rode his horse throughout the, the war-torn South to try and mend broken people. And one of the stories is about a woman that he met and talked to. She was so embittered against the Union because she had become a widow during the Civil War. And the Union troops had come on her farm and and 
when Robert E. Lee was there, she pointed to a grove of trees. She said, and they camped down there. They, they carved their names into those trees, into that grove of trees. They, they used those trees as target practice. And she had practiced and rehearsed the bitterness for so long. She said, well, what am I to do about that? And Robert E. Lee said, cut them down and move on. It's easy for us to get historical. Historical about things we've done or things that have been done to us. And to rehearse and practice maybe those things that we've done or maybe those things that have been done to us. Jesus died on the cross to take away the power, the power of guilt and the power of shame. Those things we've done and those things that have been done to us. He nailed them to the cross to take away their power. And the reason that he rose from the grave is that he might live his power, that that victory power through you and through me, that we might know power over them and press on, that we might not rehearse, that we might not practice, that we might not get historical, that we forget what lies behind and we press on through the power of the risen Christ. This morning, it may be that you're in that place where you've been rehearsing hurtful things. It may be something that you've done, a guilt. Or it may be something that was done to you, a shame, a betrayal. And you've been practicing it again and again. There's nothing, there's nothing that is Christ-like about that at all. Jesus Christ died to take away the power of guilt, the power of shame, and he rose to live his life through you that you might press on. Press on in relationship with Jesus Christ. That you allow him to live his life through you. Or it may be this morning that You've been compromised not by bad, but by good. And you've been letting your identity, your primary identity, be good things. Very good things, but not Jesus Christ. You are his own, his very own possession. He is the vine, and and you, you are the branches. There's no identity, there's no life unless we're connected to him as his own and that this morning you've heard the voice of Jesus giving you a nudge inviting you into a personal faith not as a good example but as the Lord the leader of your life to follow him well I want to pray with you this morning join with me in prayer Jesus, it doesn't take long at all for us to to know we don't have strength enough for this life. That it's your power, the power of the risen Christ. It's why you rose, that you might live your life through us. Give us power to press on. To press on in a personal relationship with you. We've tried to do it on our own. And may this be a new day a fresh day, a new beginning. And maybe that we've been listening to the voice of good things and our identity has been compromised. And we've not been following the bad things, but we haven't been following you. Grant grace enough that we hear your voice. Stop practicing, listening to those other voices. But we follow you. And remember who we are. That we we are your own. We are your, your own possession. We are the branches connected to you. And forget who we're not. Jesus, this day, through the power of your Spirit, bring on that 
new life, that we might be restored, we might be made new and press on. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image, and what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our, when God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.